Grace Bible Church, Pearlside Online. Ain't it funny how we like to call the shots and for people to respect our authority, but we have the hardest time following authority ourselves? Pastor Norman Nakanishi shows us how God's hand is upon the authority over our lives by design. In his message, Being Chosen and Finding Favor, the opening to our series for such a time as this, being the right person in the right place for the right season. Many prophetic words have been spoken to us over the, over the years about promotion and favor. This series for such a time as this has been selected at this time because I believe we're in a season where God's going to promote many of you. And what looks like demotion is going to turn around. The position you're in, God wants to change you. And as we'll look at in this series, what we do when God sovereignly and providentially moves us will determine where we end up from where we are. So I'd like to ask you to just grab your neighbor's hand and, and, and because we're always better together and there's more power when we pray together. And hands joined sometimes help that dynamic come to pass. Lord, as we start this series, first of all, we do it to honor you because we feel we're led by you because we've heard the voice of the prophets. And at some point you say in scripture, we must believe what is said and then shall be the prosperity. But we know the prosperity is not for consumption and for affluence, but it's to extend your influence upon the earth, to reflect your glory. And so Lord, we, we pray, forgive us as a country where we try to use you as a tool, as a genie, as a Santa Claus, that if I come to know the Lord, then he makes my life good and my family good. And while that's part of your promises, it's, it's inferior to the influence and the unselfish, unselfish example you've called us to be to others. And so, Lord, I pray that you would pour out your spirit on every one of us, on every family that's represented here, in the name of Jesus, amen, which means so be it. For such a time as this is our new series, and God wants us to understand that he, he, he puts us where we are for a purpose. And we're going to look in the book of Esther at two characters. First of all, Esther herself, uh, after whom the book is named, but also the person who mentored her, who raised her, her older cousin or adoptive uncle, Mordecai. And the backdrop to this message that starts out the series, Being Chosen and Finding Favor, it's about 100 years after the people of God under God's hand of discipline for straying from him have been unleashed and released from Babylonian captivity. By now the Persians are in power. The temple, the center of all worship and activity in the Old Covenant has been rebuilt. The walls have come up, but the people of God and their lives are still being threatened. There is historic prejudicial bias towards the Jewish people. And Esther is raised up for such a time as this, as Mordecai, Mordecai has been. And it's a prophetic time that talks to us about how we are to live and what we are to do, who we are to become, who we are to be with, what we are to say, what we are to do when the Lord promotes us. And again, I wanna say prophetically, we are in a season where God's going to promote you. He never wants to leave you where you are, even as comfortable and blessed as, 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 that you may feel where you are, where you are is not where you shall be. And where you shall be in the future is not where you will be. I sound like Shakespeare, don't I? So as we launch this series, we look at this backdrop and we find that there is rebellion between king and queen, and that is more specifically King, king Ahasuerus, which is his Hebrew name, or his Persian name, Xerxes, is king over the Persian Empire. He is about to exact, history says, a bold, audacious, stupid, and arrogant attempt at invading a prevailing world power, Greece. He is, he is having an open house for six months, culminated by seven days of feast, in which he shows off all of his wealth, power, and possessions to people around him. And people from other kingdoms, as well as his own kingdom, are invited in. He's over 131 provinces. And the last piece of jewelry he needs to show off is his wife, Queen Vashti. And when that moment comes, she refuses to come at his beck and call, which is rebellion. But the problem was, in that time, there was no policy 
to deal with a queen that wouldn't listen to her king. And so she had the audacity in her arrogance not to listen to the king. And out of this, seven nobles and his closest supervisors come up with a policy that says she must be deposed, demoted, and be removed. And after years of being his queen, she loses her queenship. Four years would go by. He goes into some military exploits that don't succeed, and he's probably a little discouraged. And his mind recalls the great days he had with his wife, and he comes to the conclusion, I've got to have a queen. He puts out a search, and the search goes out for a replacement for Vashti, who loses her position. And we find the lesson out of this, because Esther is chosen, that we must honor authority. Imperfect and whacked and flawed as they may be, God always puts us underneath imperfect authority for a reason. So if you're looking at your boss, like my staff looks at me, and you say, why is he like that? I can't stand him, I don't like the way he's like that. God, give me a perfect boss. I got news for you, it will never happen. It's like, give me a perfect husband. Give me a perfect wife. Give me perfect, how many of you have perfect kids? They're perfect until they're about two. <laughs> when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel in the custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. He was a eunuch. In other words, he was removed of his male reproductive equipment, therefore very trusted by the king. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. He quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young men from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. See, Queen Vashti, the pre previous queen, allowed pride and disrespect to enter her spirit. She probably started with a feeling of blessing and privilege, but it, over time, we feel entitled to what we appreciated in the beginning if we forget who we got that place of honor from. We take him for granted, we think we did it ourselves, and we lose perspective, and over time, honor and privilege turned in, into entitlement and arrogance. All authority, as I said, even flawed, are put over us for a purpose, for a season, to develop something in us called a Christ-like character so one day we have the capacity to handle the blessing and the prosperity he wants to give us to extend influence. Again in this series, as we looked at last week, God doesn't exist to make us happy and successful. He exists to bring success and joy to us that we might express his glory to the world. But in America, it's an inverse, reverse gospel. We think subtly that if I come to the Lord, he is, in, he is obligated and I am entitled to have a rich, successful life. That is not true. In actuality, we deserve nothing. But by grace, which is unearned favor, he gives us everything so that we understand with gratitude that we are to take that everything and give it out to extend his kingdom to the world. Can I say amen? Slap your neighbor and say, amen to you, Ilya tua. By the way, I'm gonna, need, I'm gonna need tape on this thing over here because the scotch tape on my face is coming off, so this thing's kind of wild, so I may go to the handheld soon. Scripture says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God and consequently whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment in themselves. We are living in an age we don't like authority and yet God says he ordains authority, not perfect authority. Just the position of authority is there for our safety. As you know, I have embarrassingly said and Pastor Paris started this, this series out last night, the power went out because somebody broke authority and tried to break the law on our premise. And in a moment of a lack of contain, he tore at some of our power system. And so Pastor Paris preached the last part of his message yelling at everybody. 
It was like the good old days, like when Jesus didn't have a mic and it was all organic. And he talked about traffic violations that he committed on the freeway and never got caught. And I told myself, some guys have all the luck. I learned about authority very clearly that God wants to do something in me. As you know, in the 90s, I was caught speeding three times in one month. A record. A record not only for ministers, but for humans. I ended up in the drunken driving class, and, and, and the judge lambasted me in front of 60 people. Keep talking. Let's pretend okay. I'm not here. Pretend Billy is not here. <laughs> pretend he's not here. Okay. Now, I graduated at the top of the class. I never saw so many big people in one room. They were mostly truck drivers. They set speed traps throughout the state. In my church was Chief Mike Nakamura, whose idea it was. I went to Chief Nakamura and I said, man, so many traps and I got caught three times. And he looked at me. He said, it's for people like you that we set those traps. You can't even get a break from your own congregant. I understood authority. He says, in church, you're my authority. Outside of the church, I'm your authority. See, some, some, I could have felt entitled like, chief, cut a brother a break. I mean, I teach the word to you. I mean, I love you and everything else, right? I mean, I was even there when he passed. God wanted to teach me something. You're nothing. You're not entitled to anything. Three years ago, I got off of a plane after flying across the country, jet lagged as heck. My wife picked me up at the airport. And I said, as I, I was leaving the airport by Starbucks, there's a solid line there before you hit Nimitz. Many of you have crossed it, I know. <laughs> and I told myself, I'm just going to cross that line. And my wife, who's sitting next to me, is like the Holy Spirit. She says, honey, you're not supposed to cross the solid line. I said, I know, I'm tired. I'm sure the Lord will give me a break. That's in my mind. I crossed the solid line. As soon as I crossed the solid line, I heard, Eep! And I went, man. Sure enough, it's a sheriff. It's the airport sheriff. He has me put my window down. And I don't know why, officers, you ask this question. Where do you work and what do you do? Does that have anything? Any, does, what has that got to do with anything? I said, New Hope Christian Fellowship. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that, okay? Okay, honestly, I didn't even think it, but I just thought it would be good humor this morning. Um, anyway, I paid a $95 ticket. Authority is ordained by God, and I will tell you this, that it's to develop this quality in us that Esther had, and it's to demonstrate humility. As the story unfolds further, when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihil, the uncle of Mordecai, who is her elder cousin or uncle, adoptive father, if you will, Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch who had charge of the woman, advised. Pause. Why is this essential? Most candidates for queenship in the Persian Empire asked for everything to give them an edge to win the beauty pageant to become the queen. Why is that? If you lost. This is the contradiction. If you, if you were invited and you were a candidate and you were a finalist for the queenship beauty pageant, you were honored. If you lost, you were treated like a widow. You were treated like an outcast. It's, it's, it's just a contradiction. And so they wanted to have every edge possible. But Esther, who grew up under her adoptive father, understood how God blesses through authority, that if you trust them, you're trusting God above them and through them. And God honors that. She understood authority and humility, and she trusted Haggai, who, by the way, was an idolatrous eunuch. Okay? I mean, he was not, the, these eunuchs were not the most respected people in the kingdom, but she trusted him because she trusted that God had put him over her and that God would speak to her. Again, the, one of the themes of the book of Esther is his providence and the salvation of his people. Esther would be vessel to this. Well, anyway, she asked for nothing. She trusted his, his advisement and counsel, and when Esther was taken into his royal palace, the king loved Esther more. Say more. I love it when you love more. 
She loved Esther more than all the women and she won grace, undeserved honor, and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Four years later, he would have a new queen, a Jewish woman. He didn't know she was Jewish because Mordecai had counseled her not to reveal her race because they were a very persecuted people. And here the favor of God comes to a, disfa a woman of a disfavored race. Watch this. God says, the, his word says in the epistle to James, he gives us more grace. Scripture says God opposes the what? The proud, but shows favor to the what? The humble. The ultimate example and passage of humility, referring to our Lord and Savior Jesus, to me is in Philippians 2, which says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others, others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind or attitude among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. See, Esther became queen because unlike Vashti, she honored authority and she understood this principle called humility. Vashti came to the place where she thought she was everything. She thought she could have her own party, rebel against the king. She thought she was everything, but in essence, Esther humbly asked for nothing. And the exaltation of Esther into queenship points prophetically, really prophetically, to the exaltation of Jesus into lordship. Because Jesus humbled himself, equal to God, Remember, God is three yet one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's the Trinity. They are all equal in power and preeminence and glory except authority. Jesus is submitted to the Father. He was sent of the Father to this earth to be our Savior, our Lord, our Redeemer, our Ransom. And so Jesus Obedience takes him, in his humility, it takes him to the cross where he becomes sin for us and takes upon himself our shame, our sin, and our blame, and our punishment. Ultimate humility. When he was on the cross, it looked like a loss. But in, in, in his example, through humility, he is exalted in resurrection at the right hand of the Father. And here is the awesome thing scripture says we are there with him if we are seated in heavenly places once we come to know him so he takes the blame and he takes the shame the sin and the consequence for it for us but yet when we give our lives to him we bypass all of that and we are seated in heavenly places scripture says we are kings and priests with him the book of revelation tells us absolutely huge and so honoring authority demonstrating humility leads to divine promotion and when we're there we elevate others scripture says during the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate Bithana and Teresh two of the king's officers who guarded the door became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes but Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai, who had raised her. Esther's parents had passed away long prior. We don't know how long prior. And it's, it's, it's real interesting. I believe this was a test of Esther's heart because so often we are tempted to keep the credit and pass on the blame. We play the victim, but we want the victory. And yet, giving credit away and elevating others I find, I don't know if you agree with me, it keeps us humble, our hearts in check, and in favor with God and man. I think God gives us tests. He gives us tests to elevate others. Didn't Jesus do that? He went to the cross, he took our shame, our blame, and then he took us with him in heavenly places. And scripture says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, 
so that in him or through him we might become the righteousness of God. In your notes there, Ephesians chapter 2, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places. He takes the blame, blame, but he elevates us and he promotes us into a place of inheritance and authority. That's amazing. We're in a season where God wants to do some very real things in your lives. Where prophetic words that have been put on the shelf for a very long time are about to come to, to pass some suddenly more speedily. I believe God puts tests in front of us to see what we will do. And when we think that no one's looking, understand God is always looking. The Spirit is God is always brooding and hovering over the earth. If you know Jesus, He lives in you. Listen to those promptings. Follow those leadings. It's the Lord saying, He's speaking to you to guide you. Don't say that. Do that. Don't go with that person. This looks good, but don't go there. And the Lord is always tugging at our hearts. He's so merciful, He gives us second, third, and fourth chances. But understand, God is in, we're in a season where God, you're here and God wants to take you there. And then as we'll look at next week, who do you become? What do you say? And what do you do in a defining moment when you are there? That too is a test. We have with us this morning the head football coach of the very successful Lelehua Mules out of the great country of Wahiawa, starting quarterback Kaleo Aloha Piseno and assistant coach Kimo Piseno. We're going to bring the tables and chairs out. Will you give them a hand as they come up? The Lelehua Mules are one of the state's premier and elite high school football programs. And Nolan Takuda is the head coach and a Christ follower and a believer. Let me set the stage for our time together. Last week, it was revealed that Joe Kennedy, assistant coach for the very powerful national football program in Bremerton, Washington, Washington uh, was suspended for praying for his players. It's amazing how one person representing the voice of a very real spiritual enemy who has the guts to make his voice known or their voice known can cause the tail to wag the dog. Bad analogy, I know, but I can't think of another one right now. And yet, people who know Jesus are the most sometimes chicken people on the planet playing tolerance to protect our image, not wanting to appear preachy. I want to say to you prophetically, it's time to unleash your voice. It's time to unleash your influence. We are here to reach the unreached, establish believers, equip disciples, and empower leaders. Don't be afraid of the term leaders. All that is is influence. God is about to promote you and change your positions if you will unleash godly influence without a spirit of fear keeping you in prison because you are, it's not about you. It's all about him. Slap your neighbor and say, Emanuya Ilya Tuaf Afitai. Okay? Relax a little bit. <laughs> um, Coach Tokuda, I've always been a fan, actually, of your program. I'm 60 years old and I go on scoring live. I believe that you need to read the Bible and go on scoring live to go to heaven. Some people Amen. don't know what scoring live is and you need to get a life. Okay? How did you come to the Lord? Uh, it was back in um, 2007. Uh, we were in at conference uh, with June Jones as a guest speaker, and all of us football coaches were invited. Um, and what stuck out to me was when, when June Jones said, um, well, we asked him for advice. Is there any last words for, for June? And I said, yeah, I, um, whatever I asked him. I don't remember. It wasn't important. But um, <laughs> what stuck out was uh, he said, God has already chosen this year 2007 state champions. He also chose a national champion. So no matter what you did, he already know, God already knows your record. So with that being said, it just resonated with me. And I just thought, well, that means no matter how prepared I am as a coach this year, uh, God has already chosen the state champion. So I have nothing to lose and all to gain. So I decided to accept Christ in my life. And it's been eight years now. It's been eight years. Now, your, your, your wife, Danny, and daughter Tatum just left because they have a rehearsal at church. So 
but life's changed since you were single back then. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good guess, thing she's not yes. here, man, I tell you. Okay. She's gone, right? Yes. No. How, has, how has walking with the Lord affected the way you coach and work with young men? Well, th through that conference, uh, a bunch of us coaches, uh, Arnold Martinez, former coach of Moan Loa, uh, former coach from Waipao, Sean Saturnio, myself, Coach Mark Carisu, who is my defensive coordinator, uh, along with Wendell C. of IA, a um, couple other guys from Pac-5, uh, just had numerous coaches, the Yoro family from St. Louis, um, did a six o'clock in the morning Bible study you know, on Friday, you know, on game day. <clears throat> and we would meet at Moanlo Gardens Missionary Church and we'll just have Bible study together. And, and through that, we decided, um, let's get rid of that stigmatism of, of football coaches being tough and we don't have to share, you know, our love or shed tears. And we said, you know, let's coach with Aloha. Uh, when we meet our opponents and our other coaches that we play against, let's show that aloha by sharing our game film, by hugging them in the middle of the field and asking them if, you, if they'd be willing to pray with us. Both teams pray, whether it's before the games or after the games. And you know, that, that was unheard of before 2006. Everybody kind of did it in the confines of the locker room, but we wanted to be bold and say, you know, let's do it in the middle of the field and, um, and, and do that and honor him. Um, you because I've watched this since that two, I was there in 2007 in that room and you've continued to play this out then you've taken another step and allowed with great enthusiasm I might add the birth of something called through your assistant coach Kimo Paseno something called the brotherhood uh, both of you weigh in on this what is exactly the brotherhood and while they're talking let's roll some pictures up here at if you can chew gum and breathe at the same time, you can listen to what they say and see the pictures, okay? Coach, I'll let but, you uh, talk about this because yeah, this is your yeah, idea. Uh, okay, well, if I can give you a brief history of the brotherhood, it started off humbly in our home in Wahiwa with uh, my older sons, Keoni and Ikaika, and it was just a grace group, and we'd have four or five young men that would come over the house, and it would balloon up to over 20 kids sometimes in that little hot and humid one <laughs> fan living room but by the break, uh, grace of God we had brother Anthony Holyfield that would come help minister and guide these young men uh, pastor Matthew Bolasan and pastor Kiomo and that was just a big um, help to help launch this we would feed them spaghetti pizza you know uh, chili and beans whatever it took to get them to the house you get food boys gonna come <laughs> so um, and that was for about two years, and then um, Coach Takura asked me to come on board, and that's when we launched the Brotherhood at uh, the high school. And I just want to say that's, that's tremendous that you would take the risk to do that, especially in an era where, hey, let's keep church and state separated, and we have Christian people living in fear, and yet God says, wait a minute, if you live to honor me, watch what I do through you. You were about to say something. You're taking it. Yeah, it's kind of neat that I had um, Coach Paseno join my staff because I, in 2012, I was coaching an all-star team that was uh, taking a bunch of seniors, uh, mm -hmm. I think 40 of us, to Oregon, and his son Keone was on that team. I remember that. And uh, mm -hmm. we had some challenges, whether it's financially or in internally, uh, that just kind of tore our team apart, but I was watching uh, Coach Kimo as well as his wife, Debbie, and not just the love for their son Keone, but for the love of Keone's teammates and us coaches, and they had no idea what was going on behind the scenes. He just wanted to help in any way possible, and, and from that, I saw that passion, and I said, you know what, I need him on my sidelines, you know, the same way I needed God in my favor, I needed Kimo on my sidelines, and you know, he's a former Marine, he said yeah. it many times, uh -huh. um, he won't quit anything until he completes his mission, <laughs> so now his mission is to bring the brotherhood to Lelehua, and then to minister our coaches, and then Lastly and least important is to coach the running backs. And, you know, just, just so you know, I mean, Kimo's background is Marine Special Forces, um, overseeing, coordinating the gang detail uh, in East L.A.? It was pretty much all of California. So all of California. So uh, we're talking about a very unique, and he was on uh, detail for a while guarding the President of the United States. So he comes here. And he's taking a humble position right now to put his professional life aside. And this is, goes without saying, to be a father, first of all, to his sons. Two of his sons 
who played for Lelehua now are in college on scholarship playing college football, but more importantly, they're good students getting an education and honoring God while doing it. And now you have Kalealoha, who, whose main position was in quarterback as a junior. And so how did that happen? That's a promotion. Yes. So actually, Kaleo, um, when he was a freshman, I think, um, well, let me back up. When, when Keone was a senior, Ikaika was a sophomore. So they had an opportunity to play with each other. And then when Ikaika was a senior, well, actually he was a junior yet, I think I brought up Kaleo Aloha. Their JV season ended, and you're not supposed to do this. So hopefully there's another, other coaches in here. But I brought Kaleo up on a varsity as a freshman, and you, you know, you see the size difference, the, the development of body, but once I saw him run around, he has that Paseno bloodline, he was able to make people miss, he was just a special player. So I knew already that as a sophomore, I was going to bring him up, and I, when I brought him up two years ago, he played everywhere from slot back to wide receiver, um, even quarterback, um, and he, I don't think he even took one snap on the JV as a freshman, but ended up playing a lot for us as a sophomore. So coming into this season, um, I knew that I needed a quarterback, so I asked him to, you know, put his own personal feelings aside and say, you know, this is where the team needs you. I need you to play quarterback, and he took it in open arms, and earlier you said he was given the position, but I corrected you saying he earned the position. Nothing um, we do at Lelohoa is that we don't give them anything. They earn everything, and uh, Kaleo earned the starting job, and then in, in the first game against Kailua, he got injured. Um, and then we start off the season 0-3, so it was a very rough, rough start. But your, your take on, because you lost the whole season. First of all, tell us about, Daddy, the nature of the injury. Um, on the outside of your leg here, you have what's called the greater trochanter. On the inside, you have the lesser. Usually, uh, when an athlete gets injured, it's from the outside. And on that particular play, people think that he got hit, but no, what happened was um, that lesser trochanter, because of his core strength, actually pulled and fractured the hip bone. And that's when he subsequently fell to the ground. So that's the extent of the, the injury, yeah. Kaleoloha, Kale talk to us about what you've learned and gained in the suffering and the journey. Uh, the biggest part for me was to get closer to God. I felt like I needed to get closer to God in that time of um, adversity and just relying on Him more than myself and trusting in Him. And I, have felt, I do feel like I got closer to Him a lot. Um, so, yeah. No regrets? No, no regrets. Um, I even remember in the game, you know, I was limping on the field, but um, I eventually got pulled out and I... I remember bugging coach that, you know, put me in, put me in. I know I'm injured, but I can do it. And he kept telling me no, but I feel like it's not his fault. It's my fault for, um, you know, always bugging him to try to get in. And he told me, oh, that's like, that's just like your other brothers. You know, you guys always want to get in no matter what. Your take, coach. No, not at all. You know, a playmaker always wants the ball in their hands. And, and that's exactly what Kaleo Loho is. And, uh, you know, when you look at your, well, my career, one of the most things I regret was, putting Kaleo in because I knew he was sore. And then on that play, I, I took my eyes off what was right and thinking about his well-being. But I thought, Kaleo gives us the best chance of scoring and winning right now in this situation. So I put him in, knowing that he was still hurt. And then that's when he fractured his hip bone. So, you know, it was really tough, really tough for me to see him go through that. But through that, I um, mean, like I said, I blame myself. He's, he's saying he blames himself, but I, I blame me. I'm the coach. I put him in a game. Um, I couldn't sleep that night, and I knew I had to apologize, not just to the Paseno family and Kaleo, but to the team. So in front of the team, I, I stood up and I said, you know, I, as a coach, we want to think that we don't make mistakes, but, you know, we're human, just like anybody else. So I turned to my team and said, please accept my apology to Kaleo and the Paseno family for um, putting winning in front of your well-being. So, you know, I apologize, and it brought tears to my eyes. And then to hear Kimo say, Coach Nolan, I love you, and I trust you with my son. And for me, that was an eye-opener. Um, and seeing Kaleo go through that, it, it still, it's still a tough pill to swallow as I get something going in my eye, right? It's like in the first service. Football coach, we get stuff going in our eyes, we don't cry. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, it's dusty in here. But, uh, but through the, the injury, 
Khalil had to go into the training room and get receive treatment every day. And like I said uh, in the first service, he had a choice when he got injured. He could have stayed home, like the doctor said, stay off your leg. It'll heal quicker. Maybe you need surgery. Khalil didn't miss a practice. He came every day, supported his teammates, even ran around a little bit. And to this day, never did surgery. He just did rehab and, and trusted the Lord. And while he was in the training room, there's a young uh, lady in there, a student, that uh, tried to commit suicide twice. And the sad thing is she's surrounded by adults, whether she goes to her seven classes at Lelaho High School, her counselors, um, coaches, and uh, athletic trainers, and nobody caught it. Nobody knew the struggles that this young lady was going through, but it was through Khalil going through his treatment, was able to minister to her and say, hey, you know what? If you need me, I'm here. I'm here to help you, and, and I love you, and I'll tell you what God can do for you in your life to fulfill that emptiness that you feel inside. And when it was Khalil that went and told his dad, you know, now I know why I got injured. It's because if I didn't, what would have happened to this young lady? And with that, it just brings chicken skin to me and say, uh, doesn't make what I did right putting him in, but um, it was God saying, whatever plans you have, I trump them all. You know, it looks like a loss, but there's a purpose and a triumph when you reach a life. This has been an unusually aberrant year for the Lelihua Mules. I can't remember a losing year on record, though you won in so many other areas. Lots of youth, adversity, injuries. You lose your quarterback. Um, you know, we see what's happened, uh, even with Mililani. I tweet Mackenzie, and I love Mililani, okay, so we, I gotta really be, I know the rivalry between Mililani and Lelihua is evil, almost. <laughs> But, but not when you have godly men like this on the team. Yet, you have worn humility and disappointment well. Because people watch us more when we can glorify the Lord when things are not going right. Because everybody can point to heaven when things are going right and you're winning. And of all things, you had something called foot washing. Uh, foot washing in the Bible was one of the last things Jesus did for and to his disciples before his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension to the Father. In essence, he was saying, here's the lesson. I want you to do this to your brothers as I, as your master, am doing to you. Why the foot washing? What happened? And, and, and maybe uh, before you explain it, let's display it. So we got a little video here. Let's just roll it. Yes, he is. Mind you, this is right after practice, so trust me, those feet were pretty funky. Corns, whatever you think about it, <laughs> nasty. That's true. You gotta love, love right your players there. for doing this. I tell you right now. It's a losing year. But. They're carrying crosses. They're washing feet. The word has gone out in social media. Have the Lelihua mules gone nuts? And yet, you continue to honor, to honor God. Why the foot washing? And, and talk to us about that. Whether it's doing the remembrance walk and having those young men pounding nails and crosses to illustrate our responsibility for putting Christ on the cross. Whether it's the foot washing, all of that is to connect them to Christ. We all need that, though, you know, a visual display, whatever the illustration is. At any rate, the Lord had put that on my heart. He wanted the coaches to wash the children's feet or the young man's feet. So I had presented it, not knowing full detail, but asked Coach Takuda, and Coach Takuda was all for it. Everything that I presented, what the Lord has put on my heart, this man has been all in. Now, there might have been some adjustments whether because of his knowledge with the DOE or what have you, whatever we got to do to make it work, we've been able to do so. And our experience with this uh, foot washing, unbeknownst to me at the time, we just go in and allow the Lord, as you take that first step of faith, God will start to open your mind to other things regarding that. So, okay, we're going to do this foot washing, not knowing how it was going to be organized. And the day of, as we bring in the towels and all the little buckets, the Lord had prompted me that, okay, position coaches, it must be done by position coaches. That way they can be intimate with their positional players. And then those that are graduating, the seniors, that will be done by the OC and the DC uh, coach, Mark Carisu. 
So that way, it became very intimate. And you know, there was a little tension at first. Holy Spirit had put on my heart to speak to each coach privately. And anyway, they um, all came, they all partook, and even though there was some apprehension, by the end of it all, the coaches were touched more than the players. The coaches felt the love of Christ in them more than the players did. That was the incredible part of it all. It actually, um, when Coach Paseno uh, presented that to me, we kind of discussed, well, we can do it in a classroom, but I thought, hey, let's be bold, man. Let's do it right in the field. Hiyoshida Stadium in the open of whether it's parents in the stands watching practice or JV kids that's on the on 50-yard line going in and parents that walk around the track. You know, let, let's just show our love for our kids. Um, and as you can see, it is, it is bold for us to do that. And there's some kids that didn't partake in it, and it was interesting for us to catch them and on the side, hey, how come you didn't allow me to wash your feet? And he said, coach, it's just not right. I said, what do you mean? He said, we should be washing your feet. You're the head coach. I said, no. What I'm trying to show you is, if I can humble myself, I'm a head coach, and I'm washing your feet, I need you to go out there and humble yourself and serve others as well. So that was a message. We wanted our guys to say, hey, we're, we're demonstrating this for you. Go out there and serve others. That's essentially what Jesus said. Peter said, I, we should wash your feet. Jesus said, no. Parting shot from all of you. Even you, Kaleo Aloha. Kaleo Aloha. Parting shot from now. What do you think we need to take away in summation today before we're done? Just what the Lord's put in your heart. Don't be stingy with your love for Christ. We're here for a reason. Every single one of you are in here. You found Christ. He's working in your life. It's not meant for you to just hold on to your own. Extend yourself beyond your wild imagination. We all keep asking Christ to do something for us. Now he's asking you, especially you men, I'm going to tell you, stand up and be yeah, a man. On. Stand up and be the man that God called you to be. Do not be afraid. I tell that to the young men all the time. We got so many young men, they're being told other ways how to be a man. I'm going to stand up, be as tall as I can be, and I'm going to be proud to be the man that God has called me to be because I am made in the image of God. Therefore, let me walk like he has called me to be, and you know what? Along the way, I'm going to share all the love, all the passion, all the desire that I have in Jesus Christ. I'm going to pour that into you, and then you, you pour it into somebody else. That's what we're missing. We just got to go do that, and Jesus will take care of the rest. Just love them. Love, love. <laughs> For, oh, no, no, you'll go right after no, me. Quarter, quarter, quarterbacks go ahead. bark signals. So Audible, you got to go. I don't know what to say. <laughs> that was good. But um, just to trust in God and rely on him more than yourself and, you know, just stay faithful. In my party, shout out, um, when you look at our record three and six this season, everybody will look at that as a failure. But what I look at is that's just from the football field. What's more important is there were seven people that came to our brotherhood that accepted Christ. One of them was a Jehovah Witness. Their whole family are Jehovah Witness, and he accepted Christ, and he stood up and said, no, I'm going to accept Christ. So to me, that's seven and oh. To me, that's more important. Um, I heard uh, Pastor Kalai speak. I listened to a podcast from you guys, uh, Grace Bible, and he talked about God accepts you right where you are. So the example he gave was, um, for those of you that never come to church that day, I got you. So he, he mentioned, you know, when, um, when your friend wants to come over to your house and he's like, oh my God, my house is a mess. So what you do is you clean up your living room real fast. I mean, I do this too. You grab your stuff, you stick it in your bedroom, you close the door. And you only leave your friend in the living room, right? Because you, you don't want him to see your mess. <laughs> well, God wants to be in every room. He doesn't want you to close any doors. Wow. He accepts you right where you are. Yes, no sir. matter what your mess is, yes, he's going to turn that mess into a message. Yes, I don't want to sound cheesy, <laughs> but that's just what it is. You know, you mentioned it earlier. You're turning that, um, your test into a testimony. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why we can be three and six, but I'm up here speaking to you guys. Just so that he can turn our test into a testimony. Just like he can turn whatever mess you have into a message. What a so God bless you guys. What a finish. Now, the brotherhood, the brotherhood's going to go viral. It's just one brotherhood, now there will be brotherhood.
hoods. Not brothers in the hood, but that could be true. My vision is this. There's other um, coaches here, other schools here, and you may have a small grace group. You might even have something of a brotherhood. But I want to connect with you because we don't want this brotherhood just to be here, there, and uh, compartmentalized. What we want is to make one gigantic brotherhood where we get together in whatever stadium God allows us to go, where we begin to praise and worship Christ first, all together. I don't care what sport you play. I don't care what it is, but if you can get with me in the lobby, we can discuss this and we can take this where God wants to take it, where we can pray over these young men and start to change their lives from the inside out. Please join me. Coach Takuda, quarterback Kale Aloha, and Coach Piceno, thank you.